Okay, we're jumping into a really high stakes situation for clinicians. Acute vertigo. When a patient presents like this, well, the clock starts ticking immediately. It absolutely does. So our mission here is clear. Cut through the uncertainty, quickly tell the difference between, say, an inner ear problem and something much more serious like a posterior circulation stroke. Right, and getting the patient to the right management pathway fast, this really can be a life or death diagnosis and speed makes all the difference. We're looking at the best ways to build that clinical roadmap. Okay, first off, just how common is this? How often are providers seeing patients walk in with acute vertigo? It's actually quite common. Figures show it accounts for somewhere between 2.1% and 3.6% of all emergency department visits in the United States. So yeah, significant numbers. Wow, okay. And just to be clear, when we say acute vertigo, what exactly are we defining? We're talking about that sudden, very real feeling, false sensation of motion, usually spinning, when absolutely no movement is actually happening. The room feels like it's whirling around them. Got it. So the patient reports that spinning. What's the absolute first, most essential division we need to make in our thinking? We immediately need to distinguish peripheral causes, things happening in the inner ear or the vestibular nerve from central causes. Those involve the brainstem or the cerebellum. And the central causes are the emergencies. Exactly. If it's central, that demands urgent intervention. No question. All right, let's talk clues. When you're taking that initial history, what signs might point you towards a more benign peripheral cause. Well, peripheral vertigo often feels incredibly intense, really debilitating spinning. You'll frequently see nystagmus, those involuntary eye movements, but it tends to be direction fixed. Meaning it beats the same way regardless of where they look. Right. Usually horizontal or maybe rotary, but it doesn't change direction with gaze. And look for associated symptoms, things like hearing loss on one side or tinnitus, that ringing sound. Okay. And conversely, what are the immediate red flags that scream central cause, potentially life-threatening? Central vertigo usually doesn't happen alone. You need to look for any accompanying neurological deficits. Is there a new onset slurred speech, what we call dysarthria, mm. diplopia, double vision, difficulty swallowing dysphagia? or any noticeable limb weakness, or significant problems with walking, ataxia, any of those, you have to assume it's central until proven otherwise. And the nystagmus looks different too, right? Yeah. How does central nystagmus contrast with peripheral? Yes, this is where the physical exam is so incredibly useful. Central nystagmus can be purely vertical, just beating straight up or down, or it might be bidirectional. Meaning it changes direction. Correct. The direction of the nystagmus changes depending on which way the patient is looking. Peripheral nystagmus generally stays fixed in one direction. There's often pressure, maybe even institutionally, to get imaging right away, especially if you're worried about stroke. But what's the actual data on how sensitive CT or MRI are in those first few hours? Yeah, this is a huge potential pitfall. Brain imaging, even a good quality MRI, actually has pretty low sensitivity for picking up small posterior circulation strokes within the first 12 hours or so. So you could get a negative scan back. And have a significant false negative. You absolutely cannot rely solely on that early scan. That's a critical point. Relying on a clean scan early on gives a dangerous false sense of security. So clinical judgment has to come first. What's the bedside tool that's highly accurate and should take precedence? That would be the HINTS exam. Yeah. H-I-G-I-N-T-S. Head impulse, nystagmus, test of skew. When it's done carefully by clinicians who know how to do it, its diagnostic power is actually superior to early MRI for telling stroke apart from something like vesticular neuritis. Okay, let's break hints down. First part, head impulse test. What findings suggest it's not a stroke, but more likely peripheral, like vestibular neuritis? You're looking for an abnormal head impulse test. So, you rapidly turn the patient's head while they fixate on your nose. If their eyes get dragged off target and then they have to make a quick movement back a corrective saccade, that means the vestibular ocular reflex isn't working properly. And that indicates. An abnormal test like that points towards peripheral involvement. The inner ear or nerve isn't sending the right signals. Okay, but what if the head impulse test is normal? The patient keeps their eyes fixed perfectly despite the head turn. In a patient with acute continuous vertigo, a normal head impulse test is actually a very concerning sign. It strongly suggests a central cause, like a stroke affecting the vestibular pathways, but sparing the peripheral reflex arc. Right, the so-called infidelity rule. The, yeah. the normal reflex is paradoxically bad news here. Exactly. We touched on nystagmus direction. Within the HINTS exam, remind us, what kind of nystagmus points towards stroke? 
Any direction changing nystagmus where it reverses direction with gaze or purely vertical nystagmus, if it only beats straight up or straight down, that's central. And the last part, TS test of skew. Why check for vertical eye misalignment? Okay, so you cover one eye, have them look at your nose, then quickly uncover it while watching that eye. If the uncovered eye makes a vertical movement to realign, that's a skew deviation. And that means? That vertical misalignment isn't typical for peripheral issues. It suggests a problem in the brainstem pathways controlling vertical eye position. So a positive test of skew is another strong central indicator. And we often hear about hints plus what gets added in that assessment. Right. Hints plus adds a couple of key things. First, an assessment for any new hearing loss acutely. And second, a thorough gait assessment, maybe along with the finger and nose finger tests. To check cerebellar function. Precisely. Checking their ability to stand and walk, looking for severe ataxia, helps complete that cerebellar screening. It adds another layer of safety. Okay, so Hints Plus is our powerful tool for ruling out the immediate danger. Let's say the exam points away from central causes. Now we're thinking peripheral. What's statistically the number one most common cause of vertigo overall? That would be benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, or BPPV. It's usually the easiest to fix, paradoxically, but also maybe easy to miss if you don't get the history just right. What's the classic story for BPPV? BPPV is all about the trigger. The vertigo is specifically brought on by changes in head position relative to gravity. Things like sitting up quickly, rolling over in bed, maybe looking up high. And the episodes themselves. Crucially, they're very brief. The intense spinning lasts less than a minute, typically just seconds. Then it settles until the next provocative movement. And a diagnosis isn't just history. There's a specific maneuver. Yes, the dix hall pick maneuver. You position the patient in a specific way to try and provoke the vertigo and, importantly, observe their eyes. What are you looking for in the eyes? You're looking for a very characteristic nystagmus. It's typically upbeat, beating upwards, and torsional, sort of rotating. And it usually has a slight delay, a latency before it starts, and then it fatigues, fades away within that minute time frame. Okay, BPPV is most common overall. But in the emergency department, what's the acute sustained vestibular syndrome we're likely seeing that might mimic stroke? That's often vestibular neuritis, sometimes called acute peripheral vestibular dysfunction. This is the one that really causes diagnostic confusion because it's sudden, severe, and lasts for days. Right, not just seconds like BPPV. Mm. Now, how do we tell vestibular neuritis apart from its close relative labyrinthitis? What's the key differentiator? It comes down to auditory symptoms. Vestibular neuritis is purely vestibular sudden, severe vertigo, nausea, imbalance lasting days, maybe weeks, but crucially, no hearing loss, no tinnitus, no feeling of ear fullness. And labyrinthitis does have those. Exactly. Labyrinthitis involves inflammation of the whole labyrinth. So you get the vertigo plus those cochlear symptoms, hearing loss, ringing, fullness in the affected ear. We should also mention Meniere's disease, though that's usually more episodic, right? Not typically an acute, continuous presentation. Correct. Meniere's is characterized by distinct episodes, attacks of vertigo lasting minutes to hours, usually not days continuously, like neuritis. And these attacks are associated with fluctuating hearing loss, tinnitus, and often that sensation of oral fullness. All right, let's switch to management. We've diagnosed BPPV with a positive dix hall pike. What's the immediate first-line treatment? You go straight to canalith repositioning procedures, or CRPs. The Epleaf maneuver is the most common, but Cmont is another. These are bedside maneuvers designed to move those dislodged crystals back where they belong. And how effective are they? Incredibly effective. Success rates are really high, often over 90%. Sometimes after just one or maybe up to three sessions, patients can get dramatic relief. Okay, now for vestibular neuritis. What's the approach there? It involves managing symptoms, but also thinking about long-term recovery. Right. For the acute severe symptoms, the intense vertigo and nausea, we can use a very short course of vestibular suppressants like meclizine or perhaps a benzodiazepine and antimetics. Short course being the key phrase there. Absolutely critical. We'll come back to that. Separately, there's good evidence that starting oral corticosteroids like prednisone early on, ideally within 72 hours, can improve the long-term recovery of peripheral vestibular function. What about antivirals? We suspect a viral cause, often herpes simplex. Should we use them? Uh, generally, no. Despite the suspected viral link, current evidence doesn't support the routine use of antiviral medications for vestibular neuritis. Corticosteroids, yes. Antivirals, typically no. 
Okay, you mentioned the short course for vestibular suppressants. This seems like a really important point, maybe a common mistake. What's the big caution with drugs like meclizine? This is a major clinical trap. Vestibular suppressants must be used sparingly and briefly. We're talking two to three days max just to get through the absolute worst of the acute phase. Why so strict? Because prolonged use is actually harmful. These drugs dampen down the whole vestibular system, including the brain's ability to adapt. Using them for too long delays or prevents central compensation, the brain recalibrating to the imbalance. The patient might feel better short term, but stays dizzy longer overall. So suppressing symptoms too long actually hinders recovery. What should we be doing to promote that long-term recovery and central compensation? Early vestibular rehabilitation therapy, VRT. As soon as the patient can tolerate it, starting specific exercises guided by a therapist is the most effective way to help the brain adapt, reduce residual dizziness, and improve balance. Needs to be part of the plan early on. Definitely. And finally, circling back to the worst case scenario. If the history, or especially the HINTS exam, strongly points towards a central cause, like a stroke, what are the immediate non-negotiable next steps? You need immediate activation of your institution's acute stroke protocol. That means an urgent neurology consult, rapid imaging appropriate for stroke, and evaluation for time-sensitive treatments like thrombolysis if they're a candidate. And critically. Critically, you must withhold any vestibular suppressants in these patients. You don't want to give medications that could mask evolving neurological signs and make the neurologist's assessment much harder. Just before we wrap up, it's worth remembering the differential diagnosis for vertigo is broad. We need to keep a couple of other things in mind beyond stroke and the common peripheral causes. Right, like things we might be causing. Yeah. Always check a medication list. Yeah, Absolutely. Certain drugs are notorious for inner ear toxicity. Aminoglycoside antibiotics, some diuretics, even high-dose aspirin sometimes. Drug side effects are definitely on the list. And also structural issues. Less common, but important not to miss. Yes, particularly something like a vestibular schwannoma, an acoustic neuroma. If a patient reports more gradual onset dizziness, maybe imbalance, and especially if it's coupled with progressive one-sided hearing loss or tinnitus, you need to think about that. Which would require imaging to diagnose. Correct. That scenario warrants high-resolution imaging, usually an MRI with contrast, to look for a tumor on the vestibular nerve. Okay, so pulling all this together from our analysis, what's the single most vital, actionable takeaway for the healthcare provider facing a patient with acute vertigo? It really comes down to this. Your detailed history and your targeted physical exam, especially using that HINTS Plus protocol correctly, are your most powerful and sensitive diagnostic tools in those first critical hours. They're actually superior to rushing for MRI in the first 12 hours for sorting out benign peripheral versus potentially dangerous central causes. Trust your clinical skills. Trust the exam. Okay, that provides the essential framework. Now, for the final thought we want to leave you, the listener, with. We know vertigo can be profoundly disruptive to a person's daily life, their function, their quality of life, often long after the acute spinning stops. So thinking beyond just the initial diagnosis and maybe a short course of meds, how will you proactively integrate consistent early vestibular rehabilitation into your management plans to truly optimize your patient's long-term recovery and help them fully regain their function? 